Welcome, everybody. Glad you could make it. Hope everybody's staying safe wherever you are in the world. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today was um, I've been collecting data, stories, visiting companies, running workshops since uh, for about the last six years or so. And over that time, uh, five patterns uh, emerged and calling them five universals is kind of a way of avoiding calling them principles. So, you know, if you think of, um, you can, you can type an answer in the chat and this will probably be a pretty crazy question, but ha has anybody, you know, tried to change something at their kid's school or in the town that they live in? Maybe you want a stop sign put in, maybe you uh, want a crosswalk, have some new lights installed or something like that. You know, how did that, how did that happen? Did, did you look to, to uh, come up with a, a change method or go get certified in a change process to make that happen? Or what did you actually do to try to influence some of those changes? Mission impossible. Just type this in the chat. And I know it's kind of an open-ended, weird question to start off with, but uh, speak to the local council. Mission impossible again. Send a letter. Called the council, got ignored. Uh, worked as a town planner. Ah, so uh, so Christoph, you might have had relationships there to reach out with some people. There's kind of, you know, call, calling them universals is everybody can understand what it's like to have a relationship with anyone, whether that's um, a spouse, a coworker, somebody you know through the community. We can all, we can all kind of get what that's like. Um, and we all know that there's social laws in place that we don't really talk about, but we know how to cultivate and foster those relationships. But we seem to forget that stuff when it comes to change. We think that if we can just somehow get a bigger hammer to whack people over the head with um, and, and the right standard set of tools and steps, we can make change work. And the data that I collected over the last six years kind of talks about the, the opposite. So what are these five patterns that people have been using that have helped them move change forward. So where did this come from? Uh, people often ask, how, how did this come to be? Where did these five universals come from? What kind of started this uh, road of uh, lean change management? And this was uh, working with a enterprise uh, organization um, back in uh, 2008, 2009. And then I think I hit a point where a lot of change agents do, you just, you can't figure out why nothing is working. Um, so I wrote a post around, there's got to be a better way to do this. Uh, like, what, what is it that's missing? Why don't people want to do this? And that spawned into um, a talk that I did at the, uh, the Big Agile conference. And uh, someone from Pearson Education approached me and said, nobody's really talking about this whole organizational change stuff. There's a couple of little pockets here and there, but it's not really anything that people have paid much attention to. Do you want to write a book? And I said, yes. And then I did nothing for about a year. And then that turned into a set of live lessons through Pearson Education on how do we take some lean startup ideas and agile ideas and mix that with some organizational change ideas so we can find an approach that's most likely to work in our organization versus taking a kind of a cookie cutter approach to stuff. Uh, 2012 was the first edition of the book that came out and uh, it was terrible and littered with uh, typos and things. So the 2014 version that was rewritten has 30% less typos, but there's still a few in there that I get reminded about uh, from time to time. And it was really looking for a story to wrap these ideas around. And, um, you know, that eventually led to the last six years of running workshops, visiting companies, I don't know, talking to tens of thousands of change agents all around the world. And that's agile coaches, that's change managers, HR people, team leads, pretty much everybody that is, you know, doing some kind of change. You can think of it, you know, a tech lead wants to bring in a new source control system. That's a change. And they're a quote unquote change agent or change manager for that. Um, and they want to figure out how do we do this? So it's a pretty broad perspective of all of this stuff that's kind of happened. And um, it kind of turned out that, yeah, there, there are some common things that help people move change forward. And the interesting thing was the main difference was perspective. So when you come at it from the perspective of a, a external change person or consultant, you have a very fixed window of time 
working with the client. Whereas people who are in the organization, they're in it for the longer term. So the perspectives are different where, you know, we might have to maybe push more uh, or try to ensure some type of change because we're there for three months or six months or a year. The people that are in the organization often have more of a luxury of time. They can kind of try some experiments. They can intervene at the right times to try to nudge things just a little bit forward. So these five things are really coming from the perspective of learning how to think in your own context and how to intervene in your organizational system in the right way at the right time, instead of just following a, you know, kind of a set of steps. So that was based on uh, asking people, what's your challenge with change? And, and then we explore how to overcome that. So collecting this stuff, you know, the picture here on the screen, uh, one workshop, somebody built something out of Lego as their challenge. And then when we went to talk about it at the end, he couldn't remember what he built. So I don't know what that, I don't remember what that challenge was about, but uh, I've got six years, piles of sticky notes with all of this stuff and organized it in a way that distilled it down into things that seem to be the most important areas of focus for people. And uh, people are always asking, you know, how do I get those people to do this? How do I apply agile to this? How do I get buy-in from those people, whether it's board members, stakeholders, uh, managers, <coughs> people on teams, etc. cetera. Um, it's always, it was always something that's external. How, how do I influence a system around me? Um, what's the best practice for this? So after organizing all this stuff, one of the things that came to mind very quickly was ha having a, a common purpose to pursue. And we're kind of taught a, about urgency for change. Uh, we need to create urgency to get people to act. The problem I found with that is urgency is a biased perspective, usually from the organizations, uh, the board members, or the executive view. So our urgency to change is our market has been disrupted, the company's going to die. Our urgency for change is the board has mandated a 5% revenue increase that my bonus is based on. Therefore, you guys have to work harder and change. But it's always seems to be from that perspective. And that's not very compelling for people on teams. Uh, one organization I went into, um, they, uh, the CEO uh, at, a, at one of their HR events was talking about their transformation that they were going to embark on. And everything was numbers. Everything was revenue targets for this, three strike rule. If you screw up three times, you're out on your ass and all this kind of stuff. And when they talked about revenue in healthcare, Imagine you're a person on a team. Do you really care if you're going to make some rich people a bit of extra money or a multi-billion dollar company a few extra bucks? That's probably not a thing you can rally around. But if you know you're building software that, that caretakers are going to use to take care of your sick grandparents, that's something you can get behind. You can really understand that as a person who's kind of contributing to either building software or providing services. So the first pattern was, if we shift our, our thinking away from instilling urgency on people, which is just very stressful and uh, a, a common term you might hear in the change world is burning platform, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard because people don't realize where it came from. It literally is the platform is on fire. So jump off or you're going to burn to death. And that's a horrible metaphor for change. I hope no one uses it. Um, but that's what we were kind of taught as change agents. You have to instill this stressful urgency. So we need to shift the conversation away towards a common purpose. Uh, Patagonia is a great example. Um, the book, Let My People Go Surfing, um, describes the pursuit of purpose. So profit comes when we pursue our purpose. The second one was... Uh, you, you probably see a lot of uh, change communication. We need to communicate and we need to have two-way communication. And more often than not, what I saw over the last number of years is that the pattern is communication is broadcasting. So we, we talk at you people and we tell you people why the change is important and we tell you why you have to participate. Um, and then when you don't do it, we say, but we communicated with you. Why didn't you do this. We, we had a comms plan in place and we want to shift away from that and, and more towards having meaningful dialogue. So that's not just broadcasting. There's a time and a place to share information and 
there's a time and a place to actually understand and have empathy for the people whose lives are going to be changing on a daily basis. So we understand what's important for them as change agents. Instead of just executing our standardized process, how do we move towards experimentation in the right context? So, you know, if your change is moving a bunch of printers to another floor, experimentation doesn't make a lot of sense. If you're trying to do an agile transformation or a digital transformation or anything that's very complex, uh, sometimes our goal as change agents is to learn about the system we're trying to change, maybe not to get to an outcome. So if we move more towards thinking about how do we intervene in the organizational system with well-timed experiments that jiggle things a little bit and get people to act, um, we're going to learn ourselves towards uh, the outcomes that we want to get to because we can't really know all that stuff at the start. Uh, the fourth one, this is probably my favorite one, and if anyone has seen um, version one's State of Agile Development Survey, uh, resistance to change has been one of the top three reasons for agile transformation, quote unquote, failure for all 15 of their surveys, so for the last 15 years. So if that were true, then we're not getting any smarter as a community. Um, plus, I don't think we're looking at it the right way. If we shift towards how people are responding to change, that's actually data that tells us something's not right. So if people are outright defiant resisting change, which is often labeled as active resistance, something's not right. It's not the right change. It's not the right time. Or we completely missed the boat as change agents when we were coming up with the plan. So that friction is actually a good thing. That's feedback that tells us something isn't right. We have to adjust and change. If nobody cares, that's still feedback. So if it's more like passive resistance, and you may see stuff like you're in a meeting with you know the 14 managers of this mid-sized organization that wants to transform to agile, you come up with uh, you know a roadmap of what you want to do, you create the pillars and all this kind of stuff, and everybody nods their head and says, "Yep, we definitely have to do all that stuff," and nobody does anything. There's a reason why. Um, but we often go to those people are resisting. We need to wrestle them into submission. Um, and if we just take a look at that response that people have to that change, it's kind of the same for all of us. When something changes in our environment, we have a reaction to it. And before we jump to those people are resisting it, we need to understand what that reaction is. And we need to have dialogue around why people are reacting the way that they are. And uh, getting buy-in is another one of those old traditional change things that's, that's been very popular. So I, as the change agent, need to come up with the plan and sell it to people. Um, I've had so many people over the years saying, how do I sell the change to the managers? How do I sell this to the executives? And then my answer becomes, well, what are you working on if they didn't want to do this in the first place? We're kind of the people that facilitate change happening. Um, often when you see that dynamic, the change approach is, you know, what Jerry Weinberg calls dropping the change through the hole in the floor. So the people at the top read an article in CIO magazine and said, oh, that's why uh, we're not doing well. We need to sell, uh, we need to do a digital transformation. So they drop that through the hole in the floor, the change people pick it up, and then they have to start selling it to people. If we, instead we focus on co-creating that together, we put the emphasis on the problems that we're trying to solve. And uh, a friend of mine, Jill Forbes, um, who worked for National Leasing, uh, we did a, a few case studies on how she used some, some of the lean change ideas for a, a big program that they worked on. Uh, she said, the people who write the plan don't fight the plan. So we want to develop it and build it together with people uh, versus us creating it in a closed door, closed office, and then trying to sell that at people. So those, those five patterns all are really, the way that we look through those lenses and approach them is based on who we are as people. Um, I went to a traditional change conference that was using um, open space technology. So uh, has anybody on the call heard uh, about open space or have been to one? Just type a yes in the chat. Okay, okay, good, a few. Um, so I'm gonna describe open space 
And then in the chat, tell me, put a yes if I got it right and put a no if I didn't get it right. So um, here's how I'm gonna moderate it. So I have four areas of this conference center where we're gonna host topics. Area number one, our topic is uh, number one. Area number two, our topic is number two. Area number three, our topic is topic number three. Four, it's topic number four. Your moderator has a list of questions for topics and uh, you're gonna be organized around those moderators and they're gonna ask you the questions and you'll answer them so we can create dialogue and use this awesome open space technology. So is that what open space is? Not good, oops, no. No. Yeah, of course not. That's, that's not at all what open space was. The interpretation of how that practice was used was based on the beliefs of the people who were organizing it. And their belief was, if we organize an open space and no one has anything to talk to, they're going to blame us for a crappy experience. So you and your beliefs are probably the single most influencing attribute for how the change unfolds in your organization. Some people are naturally curious problem solvers. Some people are naturally very, very good planners. Who we are and what we bring to the change is how that change is going to unfold. And uh, I told that story actually in that conference because they, they had me there as a speaker. And I said, here's the fundamental difference around you guys wanting to learn about what agile change management is. Here's what happened here here's actually what would happen in, a, in an Agile conference. Do you see the difference between the two? Um, and then we had a conversation around, well, why did we use a practice but forget the principles it was based on? So we start from who we are. We all have our baggage and the lenses that we look through, and that influences how we apply the tools. Um, I've seen this with Lean Coffee. So for anyone who has done Lean Coffee or knows what it is, I've been in some organizations where the lean coffee is the leaders come with a list of questions they want people to talk about and we just do a time boxed conversation for each one, which we all know that's not what lean coffee is, but it's coming from our beliefs. It's coming from who we are as people in the lens that we're looking through. So the method isn't going to help. The, the practice isn't going to help if we don't consider the practices that they're based on. And uh, it, it's all about balance. It's all about, there's a time and a place to give people information about a change. There's a time and place to have more meaningful dialogue so we know what the right things are in the first place. So as change agents, we have to figure out how to balance that at the right time. You know, logic will say when you start a change, you do an assessment, you create awareness and desire for the change, um, and you get everybody kind of collected at the same mental state and you start executing, you close the project down. Uh, it never works that way, ever. Um, that's just not how social systems change. So we're, we have to kind of balance the teeter-totter of these five dimensions based on the, the response people are having to change, the feedback that we see, and really how do we intervene in the right way at the right time? You know, if people are really pissed off about your agile transformation and you're not getting any results, a better comms plan won't help you. A retrospective probably will. A lean coffee, um, an anonymous uh, tip or anonymous suggestion jar or a town hall session where you're asking questions that are being posted uh, on a projector behind the leaders who are talking in real time things that are invoking meaningful dialogue, those are probably the right things to do. And I say probably because there is no right and wrong way. You know, if, if you're an external change uh, consultant or coach or even internal, have you tried to take the same approach with different teams and it worked in one team and it didn't work in another? Uh, I know I have. So we forget the principles, we forget the context. So the idea with uh, th this change wayfinder or these five universals is um, we're stuck. We're not sure why. I get that a lot. I get that question a lot. Why can't I get those people to? Uh, we've been doing this agile stuff for a year. We still haven't, none, no teams have released anything. We're not exactly sure why. So we, we need a lens to look through multiple different lenses. And then we need some options. We need some things that we could possibly do. And then we have to consider the principles those practices are based on. 
and then pick the one that's most likely to get us one step forward. Uh, so back when we were allowed to go outside, uh, we would do this through this uh, card game. So we'd play this card game and we would choose a perspective and we would say, what's as a change team, what's the hardest obstacle um, that we're hitting right now? And they might say, well, people don't agree on a way forward with this change. So they'll play this game and they'll pick, well, well, what do we think is the most important thing we should work on right now? And we might say, hmm, in that context, we don't really visualize anything. We don't really celebrate any of our successes. Um, we're going to take that and then we're going to run it through our change GPS. And our change GPS is going to say, if this is the thing that is important or the most frustrating or where we have the biggest challenge, what can we do about it? What action can we take? And this change GPS will spit out some options that you can try. And it's going to show you some stories from people that have tried it. And it's going to give you options so you can match the right practice to the right context at the right time. And the, the, the goal is to try to intervene your way towards more meaningful change. So instead of completely throwing out your existing change framework, whether you're using, doesn't matter, the framework uh, that you're using in your organization doesn't matter as much. The interactions where you're actually jiggling and changing that system are the things that matter. So if you're using a waterfall project management based change method, there's no law that says you can't do that. When it comes to creating your stakeholder map or your change strategy, you can still do those meetings in a co-creative way. You can still use Lego serious play or more modern practices to have people align around um, a common purpose. You don't have to get rid of the big framework and picture. You just you have to know how to intervene in that system at the right time. And ideally you're going to end up with a puzzle put together that is based on your context. Um, I went into one organization, they wanted to start their process with lean change management. So they said, how do we use your method or your framework to whatever? And um, I said, well, typically the first thing people do is they do a strategy canvas because they explore why this change, why now, what are our diagnostics, measurements, et cetera. And they said, well, we're already going to do it anyway. We already bought the software. Uh, we've already agreed we're going to change our business processes. We've got the three vendors hired. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Awesome. Let's not do it then. Tell me more about where you're at. So you're trying to intervene and move things forward in little bits at a time. And um, before we get into Q&A, I'm just, I'll show you, I'll give you a little teeny little preview about what that looks like. So it's, you know, people over the years have basically come into this with three different views. One is either I'm stuck and I need a big idea. I just need an idea. And this is the stuff that makes you think more. Um, it's not a prescriptive set of rules and practices, but it's just, I need an idea that I can kind of match to my context that will help me understand where I'm at, why I'm stuck and how we can move forward. And some people go, I really have a specific problem. I can't get those managers to show up at the transformation meetings. What can I do about that? Or I heard about lean coffee, or I heard about this new hammer I can whack people over the head with. Um, how does it work and how can I use it? So if you're starting from a big idea or from the card game, it's going to tell you, well, I'm trying to pursue a cause and a purpose. So what could you do? Well, I could, hmm, storytelling. That sounds like something that would be interesting for me. So this little GPS will give you a little overview about what storytelling is, again, based on where you believed you were stuck. Here's a bunch of practices you might want to try. Here's some experiments that people have tried already and how they worked out. So it's kind of like a crowdsourced uh, way for you to navigate through your change by intervening in the system at the right time with the right practice. So people often ask and uh, often ask, what's the next, what's the next book? What's the next set of ideas? This is kind of the next book instead of uh, it being the next book. It's more of a GPS to help you intervene 
in the organizational system at the right time. But considering who you are, your context, and the principles that some of these practices um, are actually based on. So I know I went through that fairly quickly, but I wanted to keep it to about 20, 30 minutes or so, and then get right into questions. I would say if you do have questions, you can uh, type them in the QA box. And there's one in there, so let's start with this one. Urgency for change and creating a vision for change has been a cotter pattern that's been popular for a while. He has it in the same phase of change. Do you see this as both uh, are valuable, but one is more valuable type positions? Yes, there, there's a few interesting things about urgency for change. Um, Cotter warns against false urgency, which is often what we see or what I've seen in most change programs where uh, somebody creates a fancy vision sentence that you could pretty much stick in any organization and it would make sense. Uh, and, and they end up creating what he calls fake urgency, which is not something that's compelling enough for people to actually rally around. The where I see people kind of misuse that is they think you do it once at the start in a phase and you're done, which isn't true. It's something you have to continually come back to. Uh, an example would be most organizations, if we've started that process with a strategic change canvas, we agree to throw it out every three months and revisit it. So every three months we can re-question our assumptions around why we're doing this. It's never kind of a one and done exercise um, from, from what I've seen. Uh, and when we do do that, we, we bring our own assumptions into it as the stakeholders and the change team. So we've made assumptions that this is the right vision without uh, actually getting feedback from the people whose lives are gonna change on a daily basis because of the change. All right, so Madeline, how can you successfully co-create? In my experience, when I've tried to do so, I have received a lot of conflicting opinions and then have got feedback of being too democratic. Oh, that's interesting. So I subscribe to the theory of diversity and inclusion, invite everybody to the party, but let people opt out. Um, if we're not aligned around a direction that we're headed, um, I don't think it's about being too uh, democratic, it can be a symptom of a deeper problem, potentially. Uh, if there's lots of conflicting opinions, uh, why is that? Is the change that we've decided to do not the right thing for this context right now? Um, is it too different from the existing culture? And a quick example about that, in a, a large financial uh, organization, um, I was trying to help by taking a co-creative approach uh, and, and absolutely nothing worked because it was too far opposite from what the normal culture was like, which was people were basically coerced and rewarded for doing change. So that's why it's a teeter-totter. It's about balance and timing. If you have to push and be more authoritative at the start because the culture expects that behavior, this is where you're making the conscious choice. This is where you're choosing to uh, be more co-creative because it's disruptive and opposite to what the culture expects. Or if you believe it's better to swim with the current of the organization and do things the way it expects. And then eventually you can move to a pull-based co-creative model. So that's why it's, a, it's never binary. It's, it's always a, a balance at the right time. And you can't know unless you're listening to the feedback of the organizational system. Uh, that's probably the hardest thing with a, a question that I've answered over the years for lean changes. That'll never work here because, which is kind of like saying, I tried uh, football and it didn't work. Um, it, it just, it doesn't compute. Would you say that's answered well enough? That's because football is awful. And when I mean football, I mean football, like football with your feet, not American football. Sorry, that was a very bad English accent, so please don't drop off. Um, uh, Patrick, how do you identify, ah, my questions keep changing. How do you identify that a cause for a change is good enough for people to rally around? 
Um, I think because they get involved with it, you know, agile is a really um, interesting thing that teams are often given a way to do their jobs to be more agile instead of maybe having a conversation with the, the stakeholders that, you know, we'd really like to ship stuff every three months instead of every year. And the teams, they will always figure out a way to do that. But we often come to them with a method or a framework that they must follow and we, they don't consider the organizational obstacles around it. Um, the other thing is we presume that everybody needs to be at the same level of understanding with the change, the same level of motivation to do it, uh, or it won't work. And that will never, ever happen. If you're in an organization, even with eight people, I mean, you, you can't get seven people, you, geez, you can't get three people to agree on pizza toppings. How the hell are you going to get an organization of 80,000 people to agree on a way to do Agile? Um, it's impossible. You'll never do it. You want to find the right trade-offs to make, the right balance at the right time within the context of, uh, with, within an organizational context around why we want to do this and give people freedom to do it. Um, I worked with one team that uh, created software uh, that in their words would allow rich people to make more money. So basically um, like, um, what the hell was it called? Like slush funds and stuff like that. So unethical investors can make more money uh, by investing in stuff that's not good for the earth. And to get around that, uh, they did a ton of charity work in the community so they could pursue purpose uh, in a context that was maybe kind of opposite to their beliefs. So people need something. People need something to rally around. And we, we have to facilitate that conversation as change people to figure out what it is. Um, Eh, just speaking from what I've seen in agile contexts, it's usually not compelling enough for, for people to do it uh, because it's perceived as the people at the top want me to work harder for the same amount of money and do more. I don't get it. Um, but we don't actually pursue the principles and the values of agile is having a better workplace, um, a more sustainable pace, um, in increasing our skills by having better technical practices, stuff like that. So I think if we come at it with, from that perspective, we're more likely to get people on board, but um, it's hard to say. Um, boom, boom. What is the best way to use co-creation when there are different teams involved with conflicting priorities? How best to get consensus? Ooh, that's a good one. I like, I like uh, first going to consent, which is as long as nobody disagrees, because we might not all agree, but some people or teams might not care one way or the other. They'll go with, they'll just go with whatever another group decides on. If it's too conflicting, um, you know, if, so the different teams, they have different priorities. Uh, who decides on those priorities? Have we had that right conversation? Have we had the people who set the priorities in the conversation with the teams so we can come to a trade-off that, that we can live with. Uh, I don't know if I'm making the right assumption, but for me, that's usually a case of teams that report up through different hierarchies that have different uh, objectives instilled through HR. So, you know, division one is incentivized to do A, division B is incentivized to do B, and those are at odds with each other and that filters its way down to how teams cooperate. Uh, one telecom I worked for, it was classic. There were the uh, prepaid team and there's the postpaid team. And the prepaid team, you know, their, their, their job and their objectives were basically opposite to postpaid, but they still had to work together on software. So, you know, we want more postpaid customers but we don't want them to leave prepaid for these reasons. You know, you've, you've got two competing products with competing structures. And uh, the only way that we dealt with that was stakeholders on both sides coming up with a trade-off that they could live with. Um, 
But I, I, I like to focus the conversation more around um, consent to try to create a workable, livable solution that's not the best for everybody, but good enough from the perspective of the organization. Um, that becomes very difficult when it's HR policies that are in the way. So then that's where we actually need to go as change people. We need to have those conversations. Um, if it's organizational structures that are stopping us from working together. Okay, um, let's go to the next one. So what, what is your experience working with hybrid organizations with several goals, networks, different performance measures? Are, the, are these five as relevant as in other organizations? Um, I would say it's relevant because it gives us more conscious choice as change agents. So, you know, like I said, if we, if we believe that our organization responds to change through traditional methods like coercion, performance management, punishment, um, I just personally, I wouldn't take the job because I wouldn't be able to work in that environment that is too far away from what I believe actually works. Um, but it's, um, do you have access and influence at the right levels to intervene? So if there's competing goals, if there's different performance measures that are in conflict with each other, that's where I would tend to look more at uh, Jay Galbraith's star model or a McKinsey 7S model as a frame for a conversation around how interconnected organizations are. Basic premise is, you know, if you put in performance management to incentivize developers to not create bugs and testers to find bugs, good luck not having crappy software. It'll just never happen. So those types of models talk about the impacts that um, uh, organizational structures have and how interconnected they are with our goals, with our systems, uh, with the skills that we have, with the people that we have in our reward system. So it's kind of, um, again, it comes down to using these five universals um, to have more conscious choice about how we move forward and moving the teeter-totter in, in the right position at the right time. So, you know, urgency for change. Here's our performance measures. You must get revenue up 5%. So there'll be an impact to that. Can we explore the positive and negative consequences of not having a strong purpose to follow. Uh, so ultimately, if we want to increase revenue by 5% and the purpose is to uh, make the board happy, um, it is unlikely as a change agent or agile coach, you're going to be able to influence at that level. So you have a choice to make. Uh, should you try to disrupt that system uh, or should you try to work within those constraints? Um, and massage your way through it. So, you know, when I started talking about the impact of relationships, if you want to change something in your town, how do you do it? You go to the council, they ignore you, you make more noise. Eventually they start to listen at some point or they don't. Uh, where is your level of influence in changing and solving that problem? So it's the same for this. Uh, you know, if you're working for an international uh, organization, it's unlikely you're going to have access to the board as a change agent. So you might have to pick your spots. Um, it also presumes that there's always a way to make some change work. Sometimes there just isn't a way to do it at certain levels. Uh, and it doesn't mean it's the wrong method or we didn't try hard enough. It just meant it could mean things like if you Google, uh, I'll put this in the chat as well. Um, Harvard Business Review has this really good article around uh, it right. like, likelihood to be disrupted. disrupted. And it basically shows things like for, uh, for stable industries, uh, say tire manufacturing, we're always going to have to move things from A to B. So those, those organizations that fit that pattern are very unlikely to have to transform. So when they're running transformation projects, they're probably not getting any results because they don't really need to. So then we get stuck in those questions of how do I change this system with these conditions? That system probably doesn't need to change. Um, 
if you Google that, there's some very interesting patterns. Um, Dave Snowden talks a lot about this with his apex predator theory that um, uh, when you, what you are working on becomes a commodity, uh, you can't really uh, avoid uh, the inevitable truth that your company is going to decline because that's just the law of nature, um, which is very difficult. I know it's not a very good answer, but sometimes, especially from what I've seen with some of the large financial institutions over here in Canada, the big six just kind of follow each other around. They've been transforming for 10, 11 years. Uh, and it's mostly process improvement, but it's better. So it's not a values principles based approach to transformation. Um, it's more about process improvement and that's fine, but let's just call it that. Let's be congruent that we're trying to improve our processes to make them more efficient. Let's not blow smoke up people's ass that we're going to transform and we're going to do this and we're going to do these other things when we're not able to be congruent about that. So let's go to the next one. Imagine an IT driven organization where people Mainly engineers feel that Agile is too slow for them. Ah, a large project's being introduced, which triggers a serious discussion about moving to waterfall. Without going into contextual details, what do you think is going on there? Hmm. IT-driven organization, people feel that Agile is too slow for them. Uh, I would make an assumption that if the engineers feel it's too slow, it's because IT and business are still separate and the team is outpacing the natural pace of change in the organization. Uh, I've seen this with some of the enterprises I've worked in. Uh, actually, my very first agile coaching uh, job in 20, 2006, seven, whenever it was, um, that was exactly the case. Our team had two full two week sprints of no work because the business couldn't feed us stuff fast enough. Uh, they just could not, keep up. Um, because of the complexity of what we were working on, there were 30 different stakeholder groups that were providing input into to what we were working on. And that process just took a long time. So they couldn't get us work fast enough, um, which actually was good because we, we ended up fixing a lot of uh, uh, technical debt at the time. I don't understand why it would trigger a conversation about moving to waterfall. Um, hmm. IT-driven organization feel that agile is too slow. Yeah, I mean, I, I would pick at why is there a belief that agile is too slow? Um, what are all the factors that are inside of that? Um, what's triggering, is that really what's triggering the discussion about moving to waterfall or is it something different? Is it uh, something around more uncertainty? So agile is not helping people on quote unquote business side feel certain that this project is going to go in the right direction. Maybe the business folks had a bad experience with the last agile projects. It didn't work out very well and they're a little bit shy about doing it again. Um, but uh, classic silo thinking is what stands out in my head reading that problem. Um, <laughs> That's about all I can say for that. The main reason is that Agile failed. The project is large. There are problems with product development resulting in redundancies. Okay. Uh, uh, for me, again, that's kind of an, uh, it sounds more like an alignment problem. How, how did it come to be that we wanted to try Agile in the first place? Um, what do the structures in the organization look like as far as how people are organized around the work, et cetera? Those are kind of the questions I would want to pick out a little bit more, but it's, it describes a very similar pattern. What I've seen in large organizations where it's been more um, um, strong functional silos, strong separation between it and business, not a really good uh, purpose or cause around why we wanted to, to move to agile in the first place. Um, could be a whole pile of things. <clears throat> that, I mean, that question, if anybody knew the answer to that question, there'd be no need to have webinars like this or any conferences or any books because it would have been solved. Um, that problem, will, we'll still be talking about this problem 50 years from now with whatever method replaced Agile because that is a social construct problem in my view. 
Um, <laughs> I think the last thing I'll say about that before moving on to the next one is with a large financial institution working in their HR uh, area, the um, VP of HR said, Agile will never work here. And when we picked up that problem, it was basically he's responsible for payroll for 80,000 people. And if he tries something new and screws that up, it's actually worse for him. So for him, it wasn't worth it. I would much rather follow the status quo. If something breaks, at least I can say I followed protocol, uh, which sounds crazy, but hey, if, uh, if it's this guy who is on the hook for it, then it's kind of his choice, I think. Uh, the author names for the star and the other one, uh, Jay Galbraith. Put that in the chat, Jay Galbraith, star. And um, McKinsey7S from, uh, created by Tom Peters in the late 70s, if anyone's heard of his book called In Search of Excellence. It was basically business agility before business agility was trademarked. Um, he talked about all this stuff decades and decades ago. Uh, oh, sorry. McKinsey, not Mud Kinsey. <clears throat> but if you Google it, you'll get close enough. The entire product development was decimated. Oh, geez. That's just getting worse and worse, dude. <laughs> okay, so imagine this scenario. We are living a critical situation. The change is necessary due to the pandemic. Yep. Uh, our company will break down. Everybody understands the need for reinvention, but only some move on. How can we react? How should we behave? What can we do? Uh, deal with the emotion of that situation, which we sometimes don't. Uh, global organization I was doing some work with, they knew they were going to cut X percentage of workforce and as a global change team, the conversation that we had was, how do we do a change program to get people to work smarter and not harder and do less with more? And I asked them, who's been part of a restructuring where you were let go? A couple of people raised their hand and I said, as soon as you heard that, did you want to work harder? And they were like, no, I wanted to burn the building down. So we got to deal with that emotional reaction. We have to consider... Uh, that people's lives are being impacted uh, across the world with this. And we have to have those um, authentic, open conversations about how people are doing as people. I think the pandemic has shown that many organizations and government are actually more resilient than we give ourselves credit for. Government of Canada has been fantastic with all of the programs. Basically, you know, a week after everything was locked down, they started creating programs that would normally take months, if not years to do because they were put in a situation where, where they had to take action instead of just planning. Um, and seeing understands and quotes, maybe it just hasn't sunk in yet. It could be, you know, if you look at the sat satire change model, any foreign element that disrupts the status quo, it takes a while for people to make sense of it. There's, there's some emotional reaction that people will have. And, and often I think as change agents, when that happens, we get pressure from stakeholders to come up with the change plan to get past it. And we forget that we need to sit with that. Uh, people need to sit with that emotional reaction before they can, they can move forward. Um, I don't know if that helps with that question, but uh, that's what I see. In a small team, is there a limit to the amount of chance you, oh, an amount of change you should enact at one time? In a small team, is there a limit to the amount? Hmm. Um, that's a tough one. I, I see these really cute things where people say, when's the best time to do a new change when the last change is done? Yeah, duh. Uh, the hard part with, um, limiting work in progress for change is, you know, with a software feature, you know, when it's done with a change, you never really kind of know. Um, change fatigue is a thing that the traditional change world talks about a lot. And the only way I know is, is through observation. Like are people stressed out and frustrated and 
Um, are they tired of things changing all the time? Um, if we deal with that through retrospectives and dialogue, um, one organization where we had, I can't remember how many teams, 30, 40 teams, we actually had a change Kanban at all of the areas where all of the teams sat and they were able to pull a change when they were ready. So instead of creating a standard set of practices and pushing them out to everyone, we created a whole bunch of stuff that they could do if it helped in their context and we let them pull when they needed to. The hard part with that, with that was managing our manager's expectations because he wanted you know, the, the, the perfect plan and forcing teams to do this and measuring them against that. And we just dug our heels in and said, no, dude, we're not doing that. We're doing it this way. Um, and that was much, much better uh, for them. So if they were never ready, uh, they were never ready. We put our energy into the teams that were pulling stuff. And then ultimately when you run into the, well, why isn't my team doing as good as that team from one of the VPs? They're busy. Uh, they don't have time for change. Well, why not? Uh, because you have them working on 17 projects at the same time. So then we actually get into real good systemic conversations around why it might not be working. So it's, it's more of an art for me than science. And a lot of it is just observing. We're kind of, uh, seems like the flow of questions has, uh, has come to an end. So um, uh, yeah. all that leads me to, uh, to say is thank you very much, Jason, for, for uh, coming in and speaking to, uh, to us. Uh, it's very good. I uh, really enjoyed that.